Good morning, everyone. It's very nice seeing you all back. Um, we hope you're happy with how our first day went. We are very happy to be joining everybody today and having a really uh, long and productive work day. And uh, I'm very happy that we're starting on this way with our three, third keynote, one that will join us here in person. So uh, I'm here to give you a short introduction to one person who is very special to our community here, but we believe for the study field that we are, we are all in uh, worldwide. This is Krinka Vidaković Petrov. Um, so I had just an opportunity uh, to have a little bit of informal discussion with Krinka um, while I was thinking of how I'm going to present. It's very difficult when you are presenting people who are keynote speakers, especially people who had as long and productive careers as Krinka did, because you can approach it from so many angles. You could only perhaps read somebody's um, biography and that would be enough, and this is in our scientific field, what is left behind us. But I'm actually very happy that Krinka is um, somebody who stepped out of these uh, boundaries of purely scientific work. Um, so her career uh, is not only as a, as a scientist, it is also as a literary translator, it is also as a diplomat, and it is also somebody who uh, didn't um, decide to spend the last part of her career in a, in a silent library setting, but to continue, uh, to continue her work in a very, very turbulent uh, memory field in contemporary Serbia. Uh, Krinka Vindaković Petrov is a principal research fellow. She spent most of her scientific career in the Institute for Literature and Art here in Belgrade. These are uh, years 1970 until 2001. Uh, at this point, Krinka was appointed ambassador to Israel uh, from then Yugoslavia, Serbia and Montenegro. She was a wartime ambassador, so these are years 2001 to 2006. Um, she, of course, throughout, her, throughout this time and after these years continued uh, her scientific research, uh, but the, the last big uh, affiliation that she's carrying, she's carrying right now, and this is director of the newly founded Memorial Center Staro um here in Belgrade, Serbia, which we'll have a chance to get to know better tomorrow. Um, Krinka is our most eminent uh, scholar in Jewish studies and Hispanics. Um, I was, I, I wanted to maybe uh, explain her career in two key words, and key words which are important for this conference, and this is women and firsts. Um, Krinka, I was, it's very interesting for me when I read this uh, part of her biography. So she uh, studied Jewish culture, Jewish Sephardic culture, from the earliest, um, earliest uh, uh, university uh, level. So her basic university level, which was uh, philology, university, faculty of philology, University of Belgrade, uh, she did research on this topic. And when she wanted to do a PhD on this topic, University of Belgrade actually said, no, <laughs> what is this topic? Who are these uh, Sephardic Jews? And we are, not, we are not going to allow you to do this here. So she went to Zagreb. It was then um, part of the same country, but still very big country and different cultures. So she finished her PhDs on this topic in Zagreb. And her book, which is today our most important book on the Sephardic culture, uh, was published in another um, constitutive uh, country of former Yugoslavia in Bosnia and Herzegovina, in Sarajevo, culture of Spanish Jews of Yugoslav, on Yugoslav soil in 1986. Um, these firsts made it possible uh, for work we have today. It made possible that today at University of Kragujevo we have Judaic um, uh, um, uh, Cathedra, we have, uh, we have people who are studying this, we have space where this can be done. Um, firsts are also 
um, we are now talking about women in the Holocaust, and this is the first conference, first for first international center dealing in this topic. But we forget that women like Krinka, like Lili Zamir, like Batya Brutzing, like so many here who are actually pioneers of this field, what it meant to be first, what it meant to be a woman in this field, and what, what it means that we get to a point where we can make this kind of conference. Um, Krinka was also uh, in, this po in this position as an ambassador, as a woman ambassador in Israel, in wartime Israel. Um, she is now in this position, even so many years before, uh, ahead of an institution which is very, um, um, very um, contested, which is contested in terms of politics of memory, which is very, um, with many forces from many sides trying to penetrate. Um, I, uh, we mentioned uh, Krinka's work on Jewish studies, and she was also she's also an awarded translator from Spanish and English to Serbian. But now I want to get to the point where Krinka is also one of our first Holocaust studies scholars uh, in this region. Uh, her field is Holocaust literature, Holocaust literature in Yugoslavia. Her field is uh, memory studies, transgenerational memory. Uh, but also uh, Jewish identity in, this, in these aspects, and also not only Holocaust, but how literature is connected to war. And we are here also in a region which is very uh, war-laden. Um, her presentation is going to be in this subject. I want to thank her for being here and uh, present to you this lecture, The Gender Perspective in the Writings by Jewish Women, Holocaust Survivors, Yugoslavia, Krinka. You have a floor. Thank you uh, very much. Um, listening to you, my first thought was that we all just do with passion what we do. And later on, it might turn out to be important or less important or more important. But uh, the, the first thing we feel is the passion to do the research and the scholarship, regardless of whether it will be or not be important later, many years later. Uh, I would like to thank the organizers of this conference, the WISC, the new uh, Women Holocaust International Study Center, and uh, Yaakov Asher and Lili Zamir for um, offering us and providing us this opportunity to, to delve into this subject and also to thank the uh, uh, Shoah Lab in the Institute here, uh, Dr. Pisari, Dr. Vera Mevorah, and of course uh, Dragana and Sonia and all of those young people uh, who made it possible for us to have this very fruitful uh, meeting and exchange of views. Uh, I will be speaking about, since I am uh, not a historian, I'm in the field of literature and culture. So I will be speaking about uh, the experiences of several Yugoslav uh, women Holocaust uh, survivors. Uh, but even more so about how they wrote about these experiences and how their writings had an impact or failed to have an impact when they were published. Uh, let me just check, okay, if this works. Yes. So I will draw your attention to four Yugoslav Jewish women who experienced, survived, and wrote about the Holocaust. Their names are little known, some of them almost unknown, both in the post-Yugoslav cultural space and abroad. My intention is to offer an insight into their lives, the way in which they experienced the Holocaust, how they wrote about the latter, and how their writing fits into the gender and Holocaust studies framework. The first one is Hannah, also known as Anitza Levi Haas. You can see here uh, when she was born and so on. And uh, she wrote, she was in Bergen-Belsen, and she wrote about it uh, as a notion of suffering. But we will see uh, what this really means. 
Hannah was born in 1913 in a Sephardic family of Sarevo, where she was raised with three brothers and four sisters. As other Sephardim living in Sarajevo in the 20s and 30s, they spoke Judeo Spanish at home, but they also knew the majority language of the country, Serbo Croatian, or Yugoslav as they called it. The young Hanna strongly believed that the future of the Jews lay in the integration, not only into the Yugoslav cultural environment, but even further into the international framework which is actually a combination of diaspora nationalism and left-wing internationalism. She wanted to be called Anitsa, a Slavic version of Hana, and even at home she preferred to speak Yugoslav rather than Judeo-Spanish. She was not religious, nor was she a Zionist. And she strongly embraced the leftist ideology, popular at that time with her generation, promoting the ideal of equality and freedom for all, including Jews. Her political convictions were reinforced during her student days in Belgrade. She studied French and following graduation from the University of Belgrade, Hannah was posted as a teacher in a school in the Montenegrin small town of Danilograd. From 1941 till late 1943, Montenegro was under Italian occupation. But after the fall of Italy, the Germans took over. Being both a Jew and a communist sympathizer, Hannah planned to join the partisans, but didn't. She was arrested in Cetinje in February 1944 when the Germans were rounding up communists and Jews in Montenegro. Most of the latter had fled to the Italian occupation zone from the independent state of Croatia. They were interned in a prison in Cetinje and Podgorica in Montenegro, and in June 1944 the Jews were segregated and transferred to the Nazi Anhalte Lager at Saimiste, Belgrade, and from there deported to the Bergen-Belsen concentration camp together with the Jews from Kosovo and Metohia. In April 1945, Hannah was among several thousand Jews who were loaded onto three trains destined for Theresienstadt. She never got there thanks to the Red Army. After the war, Hannah returned to Belgrade, where she worked for the new government as a French translator and supervisor of French broadcasts at Radio Yugoslavia. However, as the Tito-Stalin conflict loomed in 1948, she decided to leave Yugoslavia. Roughly half of the Yugoslav Jewish survivors made Aliyah to Israel between 1948 and 1952. Hannah was among the first. She arrived with Haifa on December 31, 1948, and lived the rest of her life in Israel. During the, that long period, she never lost her Yugoslav cultural identity. Unfortunately, Israel failed to live up to her expectation, the same as the Soviet Union and Yugoslavia. Hannah Levy Haas would not be happy anywhere because the real world, world was a dystopia rather than a place of ideal equality with no national, ethnic, social, religious, or gender discrimination. Uh, here you can see pictures of the camp, which you well know, Bergen-Belsen, and uh, the books that she um, published. I will tell you about it now. Hannah Levy Haas wrote her diary in real time. And as far as I know, this is the only diary from Bergen-Belsen written by a Yugoslav survivor. Maybe I don't know about anything, but it seems that it is. On her return to Yugoslavia, she tried to publish it in Belgrade, but there was no interest for it immediately after the war. Many years later, her diary was discovered by a German researcher, A. K. Gesel, who published the German translation, while the English translation, which you can see here, accompanied by an introduction and afterward written by her daughter, Amira Haas, you can see her on the picture. She is a well-known journalist in Israel. Appeared in 2009, eight years after her death, under the title Diary of Bergen-Belsen, 1944-1945. 
Hannah's diary covers the period from August 16, 1944 till April 45, the period when Bergen-Belsen operated as a death camp. Her description of the camp is imbued with a high degree of introspection. This is typical for her writing. She says, I spent a lot of time thinking. I'm learning a lot in the midst of this misery. I'm learning how to understand many things in life that escaped me before. The concentration camp universe was unimaginable in her previous life of a free human being. Initially, her observations of the camp inmates display an ideological filter. Some prisoners are described as standard petty bourgeois type, a few typical capitalist individuals, moderately decadent types. Later on, however, she realized that the humiliating camp conditions and extremely brutal deprivations were such that all human passions and weaknesses have unleashed themselves, sometimes taking on beastly forms, a common misery uniting beings who barely tolerate each other. While the high moral values that you can sense in some people remain in the shadow, powerless. Hannah writes about two specific topics that suggest a gendered perspective. One deals with the difference between the way women and men responded to camp conditions, while the other refers to children. Hannah's barracks was divided into a man's section and another section for women and children. She noticed the difference in their response to extreme camp conditions, which led her to the conclusion that men were less resilient, less courageous, less adaptable, both in physical and moral terms. Their hunger, she writes, shows in their faces and in their gestures in a way that alarmingly, that's alarmingly different from women. She also gave an account of a conflict between the women and men in her barracks regarding corruption in which the women led by Hannah prevailed. In addition, being a woman and a professional teacher, Hannah assumed to care for and educate a group of 110 children from Yugoslavia housed in her barracks. The passages describing the children, their state, behavior, problems are lucid and very valuable. I distinctly feel, she wrote, that our school has become indispensable and that it's the only way to revive and maintain any freshness in their souls. Most of her other topics refer to the dehumanizing brutality of the camp. It's impossible to measure this ocean of suffering. The abyss of the human soul under terror is unfathomable. To try to describe all this, a useless endeavor, it far exceeds my cap capabilities. The only thing left for you now is to drop like an overripe fruit that decomposes of its own accord. However, Hannah Levy Haas survived, so did her diary, but it took decades for her account of Bergen-Belsen to come to the attention of specialists and the public. Here you see uh, several uh, later editions, one French and one uh, Spanish of her um, diary. I will now go to another example, and this is Jamila Colonomo Sadicario. Uh, the title of one of the chapters of her book is How Did I Survive? By Fighting. Uh, Jamila Kolonomos, born in Bitola, the previous name of this town in Macedonia's Monastir, uh, came from a Romaniot family that was later culturally assimilated by the Spanish Jews who found refuge in this region following their expulsion from Spain in 1492. Her father was the director of the Bitola office of the Banks Franco Serb. Bitola was home to the largest Jewish community in Macedonia with a vibrant Judeo Spanish cultural tradition. This changed in 1941 when Macedonia was occupied by Bulgaria. The occupation authorities, here you see a picture of the town Bitola. The second picture is the Sephardic Cemetery in Bitola. Uh, this changed in 1941 when, when Macedonia was occupied by Bulgaria. The occupation authorities immediately implemented the law on the protection of the nation. The latter singled out non-Bulgarians, 
in other words, Serbs, Jews, Roma, and Macedonians who refused to identify themselves as Bulgarians. So they were singled out as foreign citizens, subject to various forms of restrictions and persecution. In March 1943, the Bulgarians rounded up all the Jews from Bitola, Skopje, and Stip, transferred them to the Monopol building, you see the picture in Skopje, and soon thereafter deported them to Treblinka. None survived the Treblinka camp, where over 7,000 Macedonians Jews, almost all Sephardic, perished. Jamila, a member of the Hashomer Hatzair Youth Organization, escaped deportation by joining the Macedonian section of the Yugoslav Armed Resistance in 1943. We fought, she wrote, in conditions that nowadays cannot be imagined. Antiquated weapons, little ammunition, all manner of uniform full of patches, never with a full stomach, and many times whole days without eating completely dependent on the villagers that we could trust. We slept on tree branches placed on melting snow and many died of hunger and the cold. The freezing winter snows of 1943-1944 were heavy and surrounded by the enemy, we suffered greatly. Jamila was one of the few women in the small partisan unit. She was a young woman from a very traditional cultural environment that had made a huge leap by assuming a male gender role in order to survive and secure future freedom. After the war, when she returned to her hometown and soon realized that there were no more Jews there, she and a few friends waited and waited, but nobody from the Jewish community appeared. Nobody came back. That explains the title of one of her outstanding books, Monastir Without Jews, Recollections of a Jewish Partisan in Macedonia. There are three gender elements in this book. Jamila was a partisan fighter, but she wrote about this experience from a feminine point of view, that is, a personal and subjective perspective, rather than from a masculine, objective, and heroic perspective. She emphasized the suffering and the fear of death from hunger, cold, and exhaustion, rather than the heroism, resolve, and strength involved in armed struggle. Women fought in the battles alongside men, but they had additional gender-marked duties, such as washing laundry and cooking. And at one point, there was a very special symbolic duty that they were given, that of making the first flag of resistance. This is a symbolic event. At the ceremony of the public raising of this first flag of resistance, embroidered by the hands of two Jewish women, she was one of them, the commandant designated one of the best fighters to carry it. This involved not only a gender division of labor, but also the difference between women embroidering the flag where nobody sees them, and men displaying it in the public domain. Uh, this is, uh, you can see, Oh, where am I? Okay. Uh, you can see her book uh, published in English. Finally, Jamila describes a strongly personal event, not less dramatic than, the, than those events experienced in the partisan unit. When the war ended, Jamila left her partisan unit and returned to her hometown, eager to reunite with her family. With a few friends, they of course waited, but not a single Jew returned to Bitola. Only then she realized that they had perished and that the joy of the end of the war was heavily overshadowed by the grief of losing all those who were dearest to her. She could not even go home because her house had been pillaged and destroyed. The only personal belongings she retrieved were several of her mother's dresses that had been stored and saved by a neighbor. These were the only material remnants of her pre-war life and family, symbols of the deepest layers of her spirit and soul. She had nothing but a few of her mother's dresses, no money, no food, no help. The only way to provide for food was to sell the dresses one by one at the marketplace. 
Finally, she writes, the time came to sell the last dress, the, own, the one that was much loved. With a heavy heart, I took it, pressed it to my bosom, and with tears in my eyes, I walked the streets. I felt my mother's breath, and I saw before my eyes the holidays and imagined how she was dressed. I wavered. Que lo vende, que no lo vende. Shall I sell it or not sell it? Then a voice was telling me, Va, los chicos están fambrientos. Go ahead, the little ones are hungry. She's obviously talking about children. Then Jamila saw a woman pass through the market wearing a blue dress she herself had embroidered her initials on before the war. I was shaken and embittered as if hit by lighting. I was out of my mind. Running, I went to the bazaar and sold this last dress to the first village woman I met for a little flour, two eggs, and a scoop of butter. How much I wanted to hold the dress against me, but worse pains and indignities that we can never forget had befallen us, our loved ones who would never return. The dress becomes the symbol of the mother-daughter bond, of the family, of a previous life, of a profound disruption, and the realization that one can lose material objects, one can lose everything, but must never lose memories. After the war, Jamila studied Romance languages, partly at the Sorbonne in France, where she received her doctorate. She published several books, most of them written originally in Judeo-Spanish, and dealing with the Sephardic cultural tradition in Macedonia, the history, language, customs, folklore, culinary recipes. She also published two volumes of documents co-edited with a colleague on the Holocaust in Macedonia. Jamila's published works, viewed as an overall corpus, indicate a shift from document to autobiography, then to memoir, and finally to what James Young describes as a memorial book. In keeping with the bookish iconoclastic side of Jewish tradition, writes Young, the first memorials to the Holocaust period came not in stone, glass, or steel, but in narrative. The Yitzchor Bicher memorial books remembered both the lives and the destruction of European Jewish communities according to the most ancient of Jewish memorial media, words on paper. Jamila's memoirs are one of the very few authored by a woman Holocaust survivor and partisan fighter in Yugoslavia. And thanks to Jamila's dedication and persistence, we have a memorial book dedicated to the extinguished Sephardic community of Bitola. Uh, another of these uh, women I have selected is Magda Boshan Simin. And her experience is also different, but also very interesting. Uh, Magda Borshan was born in 1922 in the Voivodina town of Senta in an Ashkenazi family. I put this uh, map here so you could see the complicated situation Yugoslavia was in during the war. It was divided into several occupation zones. The biggest part, the brown on the left, is the independent state of Croatia. Then to the upper right side in beige is the area called Bachka from where Magda was. As you can see, it's along the Hungarian border. And then you can see the gray is the German occupation zone. Then you have the light brown is the Bulgarian occupation zone. And the green light and dark is the uh, Italian occupation zone. When Hungary occupied Bachka, that's the beige, the new occupation authorities arrested Magda because she had been a member of a group that organized resistance under the leadership of the Federation of Communist Youth of Yugoslavia, so-called SKOI. She was interrogated in Subotica, tortured, and finally sentenced to 13 years of prison, while some of the members of this group were executed. She was treated as a political prisoner and sent to serve her sentence in a prison in Hungary called Maria Nostra. Now you will see how interesting that prison was, unique. In March 1944, 
Jewish women convicts in this prison, Maria Nostra, there were 15 from Yugoslavia and 50 from Hungary, were separated in a ghetto within a ghetto, transferred to the Juitofogas, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing this right, and Komarom prisons also in Hungary, and later handed to the Germans who deported Magda to Dachau Alach, then Bergen-Belsen, then Fallersleben, and finally to a camp called Salzwedel, actually a subcamp where more than 3,000 women were held, both Jews and non-Jews. She survived. Magda returned to Yugoslavia and married Zivko Simin, a Serb who had survived Mauthausen. They lived in Novi Sad and had two children, one of them, their daughter Nevena, born in 1950. Magda worked as an editor for the main public radio station in Novi Sad. She was a journalist and writer. She published a novel, When the Sour Cherries Bloom, in 1958. Here you can see a second edition of that uh, novel in uh, Serbian. And this novel is based on her wartime experience, especially in the Maria Nostra prison. A memoir, she also published a memoir on the pre-war history of her family titled The Dream of Youth, a documentary text, Women Political Prisoners in Bachka in the War, 1941-45, and also a travelogue on uh, Israel. After Magda's passing in 2006, her daughter, Nevena, born in 1950, published a book consisting of her mother's text, Women Political Prisoners in Bachka, and, and in addition, Nevena's commentaries on this text, but also on other of her mother's writings and the information and images she had received uh, from her mother through communicative memory. Nevena's contribution to this book titled Why They Said Nothing, Mother and Daughter on One and the Same War, published in 2009, is therefore a meta-text. This book is a combination of Magda's text, uh, segmented in uh, segments, and the comments of her daughter Nevena. The title of the book refers to an issue Nevena's mother never wrote about or spoke of, except once at a reunion with her fellow inmates in the late 60s. That's when Nevena, her daughter, realized uh, that talk about the women's body had been taboo for her mother and her fellow inmates. They were saying how they were lucky because their menstruation had been interrupted due to severe malnutrition, exhausting forced labor, psychological factors, and bromide. And Nevena writes, the reason for this deliberate silence shocked me. Here you can see Nevena's picture and the English edition of why they said nothing. Nevena continues writing, she was ashamed of writing that feminine word. That courageous woman, capable of enduring brutal beatings without betraying anyone, who had for several other, with several other courageous 20-year-old women practically taken care of several hundred women living in unbearable conditions, who had figured out how to turn the collective I'll speak about that later, into an organized survival machine. That same Magda was ashamed to utter the word menstruation in front of men. Now here you see a generation gap between Magda and her daughter. What both Magda and her daughter did write about extensively was Magda's experience in Maria Nostra. And this was a female convent in northern Hungary that included a women's prison run by the nuns. This environment was female from top to bottom, from the Virgin Mary in its name, Maria Nostra, to the nuns and the convicts who were both criminal and political prisoners, Jewish and non-Jewish, Hungarian and Serbian. The convent was actually a disciplinary institution, a concept, as we know, highlighted by Michel Foucault in his Discipline and Punish, but also a clearly gender-marked one institution. The women survived thanks to what Magda called the collective, what is also referred to in other sources as Camp Sisters, a gender-specific survival tragedy uh, 
strategy, relying on traditional women's skills such as mothering, nurturing, homemaking, and caretaking. Thus, Maria Nostra was a rare case which involved a double sisterhood, religious sisters, nuns, as well as camp sisters, prisoners. In April of 1944, Jewish women in the prison were deported by the Germans to various camps. At that same time, Magda's whole family, who were still living in Vojvodina in Bačka, were deported to Auschwitz, where they perished. When the Sour Cherries Bloom, published first edition in 1958, was one of the first novels on the Holocaust published in Yugoslavia and the first published by a woman Holocaust survivor. However, it attracted little attention due to various factors. Let me highlight only three. The emphasis on the epic armed resistance struggle in in the dominant war narrative of that period, coupled with the marginalization of camp experience. Second, because in that period the Holocaust was perceived in Yugoslavia as a segment of the overall war narrative that did not particularly contribute to the legitimization of the post-war Yugoslav new regime. And third, the fact that the author and protagonists of her novel were women rather than men. Magda is a forgotten pioneer of women's Holocaust literature in Yugoslavia and needs to be recognized as such. Why they said nothing, mother and daughter, on one and the same war is the result of a new approach to gender and women's writing on the one hand and to the Holocaust on the other. In addition, it opens new issues such as the role of second generation survivors, memory and post-memory. And the last uh, example is Hanna Altaratz. Uh, Hanna Altaratz was uh, born in a modest Sephardic family living in Sarajevo. They spoke Judeo-Spanish at home and kept Sephardic customs and traditions. The persecution of Serbs, Jews, and Roma began immediately after the establishment of the independent state of Croatia. Hanna's father and three brothers were immediately arrested, executed, or taken to the Yasinova's death camp. Her mother and sister perished in the Jakovo camp for women and children, so no members of her immediate family survived. Hanna did so by assuming a false identity, changing her name to Fanica, and hiding in Sarajevo with her cousin and later with a Serbian school uh, friend. In late 1944, she joined the partisan army. After the war, she married and had two children, but became a widow at the age of 27. As a single mother, her life was that of a modest worker. She had no particular education as a homemaker and a caregiver. Here you can see the first picture are the parents of Hanna Altaratz, traditional. And the next picture is a picture of the Sarajevo quarter where she lived after the war and uh, Hanna with her two children after the war. Um, by the 1980s, she began enjoying being a grandmother until a new war broke out in 1992. Fanica spent this war in her hometown Sarajevo. Like many other survivors, she too had a sense of guilt for having survived the previous war, the Holocaust, while her whole family had perished. So this time, she was determined to make sure her descendants survive, even if she doesn't. She left Sarajevo in April 1995, eight months prior to the Dayton Accords that ended this war. Only when her son, daughter, and their families had been safely evacuated from Sarajevo, and that same year, after she left Sarajevo, she joined her family in Canada where they made a new home. Late in her life, while residing in Canada, Fanica decided to record the memories she had during many years been passing on to her daughter Branka through what Aleida Asman calls communicative memory. 
These memories were fragmented similar to what James Young describes as a series of freely associated moments, kernels of time around which events gather and accrue significance. Thus, in the making of the book Fanica, uh, we see uh, an interaction of various, various types of mediation showing the relationship between first generation and second generation survivors in the making of the narrative, showing that this relationship is a dynamic category. In some chapters, we observe multiple intersections of various perspectives. The second picture shows Fanica and her daughter Branca. Uh, in, uh, in the case of Fanica, one of the four structural sources of gender differences identified in the pioneering study Women in the Holocaust, co-edited by Lenore Weizmann and Dalia Ofer, is very evident. This is the culturally defined general gender roles ingrained, ingrained partially in the pre-war Yugoslav culture, but even more so in the Sephardic traditional culture. One example was the custom, for example, among the Bosnian Sephardim to encourage little boys to hold a book, while little girls were given thread or their hands would be sprinkled with flour, thread for embroidering, sewing, and flour for cooking. When Fanica was finally leaving Sarajevo, she could take with her only a few precious things. So what was her choice? Uh, personal documents, several faded photographs, and embroideries, her own and from her closest those made by her closest cousins. She also made sure to save her daughter's wedding dress, and it was this dress her granddaughter in Canada would wear at her own wedding. The embroideries and the dress indicate a gendered value system. This is what was important for her to take when she could take only a few things leaving Sarajevo. However, there is another level we should also like to mention, the narrative, the book, actually reveals a key change in Fanica's personality, because we're dealing with two wars. During the Holocaust, she was a vulnerable and fragile 18-year-old hiding under a false identity, sheltered by female friends. While in the 90s, she was a 70-year-old who openly displayed her Jewish identity, refused to hide or flee, and remained in war-torn Sarajevo in order to safeguard her new family. Uh, Fanica, the book, was a transgenerational project, the result of the cooperation of mother and daughter. It includes the pre-war history of the Altarat family in Sarajevo, the Holocaust, the post-war period in socialist Yugoslavia, the war of the Yugoslav succession 1992 to 95 in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and finally, the forging of a new home in Canada. And let me remind you, Fanica lived a hundred years. Uh, Fanny Kautaraz belonged to a personality profile described by our Nobel Prize winner, writer Ivo Andrić, who was from Bosnia, as people who care more for life itself than for what may be thought, spoken, or written about it. I mentioned this definition given by Andrić in one sentence because this is a typical definition of uh, war and Holocaust survivors in my country, former Yugoslavia. Uh, people were reluctant to speak about their experiences. They would speak about them in, as I mentioned, little fragments here and there. Uh, but uh, in every family in this country, we have someone of our predecessors who was either in a camp or was killed in battle or was killed in some other way. But my generation, baby boom generation, it's my experience as well. My parents didn't talk about it. My grandmother didn't talk about it. My grandfather's perished, but uh, 
it was very difficult for young people to hear something from their parents or grandparents about this. By the time we were not that young anymore, we didn't have the grandparents anymore, and later on we didn't have our parents, when we would like to ask them about it. So she is a typical example. Fanica never wrote anything about her experiences because she thought that nobody would be interested in the life of a modest woman who throughout her life played the gender role designated to her by tradition. Like many other survivors in the aftermath of the war, she wanted to bury wartime traumas and to move on with her life. And when she became a mother, she sought to avoid burdening her children with these traumas. However, the war of the 90s in Sarajevo not only revived these memories, but also highlighted the fact that her generation would not be there much longer and that she had to fulfill the personal moral duty to leave behind her testimony. She could achieve this only in cooperation with her daughter Branka. Although telling the story involved various forms of mediation by Branka, the fact that her mother was able to read, check, and authenticate the resulting narrative provides the letter with essential credibility. The variation in degrees of mediation highlights the hybrid nature, nature of the Fanica narrative. Fanica, and I will finish with this, is unique in Yugoslav women's Holocaust literature due to its focus on not one, but two wars. Experienced by a Holocaust survivor in the same place, Sarajevo, and the same country, Yugoslavia, which doesn't exist anymore. Thank you. Thank you so much to Krinka Vidaković Petru. So um, her this keynote lecture was really uh, such a great introduction to our next uh, two parallel sessions. It's going to be hard for you, I think, to decide which one you're going to attend. Um, I just want to mention a couple of key words that Krinka spoke about. They're going to lead us in our discussions, in our uh, presentations that we're going to hear in the panels. And these are autobiography, memory, document, memorial. Um, I actually, uh, listening to Krinka's lecture, I think that uh, maybe if uh, we heard it before making our program, that we would call our panels not only memories and memoirs, but add to that mementos. Because these uh, physical objects, I think, um, play a role. So what we are going to hear uh, from 11 o'clock after a short break is how do we communicate memory, how did women communicate memory, and which mediums and forms did they use. Again, once again, takes to Krinka, and we will join you all at 11 here and on the first floor. Thank you. Thank you.